What is the church, the true church? Well, for starters, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not Rome, it's not cults like Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. It's not a money-making scheme or a multi-million dollar organization. The church is not a building. It's not a country club to hang out and gossip. And it's not a place to feel comfortable in your sin, or worse, glory in it. The church is not a place to set apart the word of God for the sake of man-made traditions. It's not a place to put on a show or conform to the world. The church is not a denomination. It's not Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Methodist, or Baptist. So what is the church, the true church? In the Greek, we have the word ekklesia, which means a calling out. That's the church. Colossians and Ephesians tells us that the church is the body of Christ. The church is His body. The church is a people called out assembling in Him. Christ gave Himself for the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. And if we are in Christ, then we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. This is the true church and the true reason for the gospel. The church, the true church, is born again, set apart, sealed by His Holy Spirit. Born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Set apart as His, having been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit, we have the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. This is what the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is. Scripture also tells us that the Church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. But how come it's the opposite at times, looking more like a den of thieves and a house of merchandise? A distinction needs to be made. The Church is not where Christians meet on Sunday morning. Members of the Church do assemble in buildings, but those buildings are not the Church. Church buildings are not where God dwells. They are not a replacement of the Jerusalem temple. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? For the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. In 1 Peter, the church is likened to living stones, being built up a spiritual house with Christ himself as the cornerstone. In Matthew 16 verse 18, we see that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, it being the church, not buildings that call themselves churches, because as can be seen, the gates of Hades has already prevailed against many of those, but hell cannot and will not prevail against the church. The apostle Paul warned us that savage wolves will come and that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. Rather than the true and pure gospel, many will flock to another gospel, which is not another. Rather than heed the instructions, sorry, commands, on how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, many would rather ignore them and do what brings in the masses. Instead of putting an emphasis on spiritual things such as prayer, in many churches announcements seem more important. Rather than worship in spirit and truth, worship is often a presentation that seeks to please the sheep and the goats rather than the good shepherd who is the one it is claimed is being worshipped. Worship should include teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, not singing theologically shallow songs and repeating empty choruses. He wants reverence, humility, and sincerity in our worship. Therefore, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, not in pretense and hypocrisy. Unfortunately, these days there is also the issue of preaching that is filled with stories and jokes rather than edification and conviction. If not stories and jokes, some will seek philosophically and homiletically perfect sermons, which sadly do anything but edify or convict. Let all things be done for edification. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Preaching should convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Let's not sweep things under the rug, but speak the truth in love that the church may grow. If your brother sins, tell him. If he doesn't listen, bring two or three. If his heart is still hard, bring the church. And if he still won't repent, 
practice church discipline. This too has been ignored. Church discipline has been replaced by church acceptance. A false love, a false unity, and a false peace is all too often all too prevalent. While scripture is claimed to be the final authority, it's sadly being trumped by the culture. Where is the concern for the things that really concern God? Holiness, love, truth, and true worship. Why the catering to the goats and the starving of the sheep? Why the concern for the carnally minded and the neglect of the spiritually minded? Why are there so many comfortable feel-good messages that are powerless, all the while the full counsel of God is ignored and the true power of the gospel is not realized? Do we seek to please men or God? The Apostle Paul said, If I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Do we seek to please Him who saved us, or to please and be conformed to our denomination for the sake of a false peace and a false unity? What does Scripture tell us? The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings falsehood and is a safe haven for sin. The fear of God brings purity and justice. Should we fear man and therefore be quiet in order to fit in and be loved? Have we bought into the new definition for tolerance that the world is spreading? And because of it, do we cower from declaring the whole counsel of God? Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Preach the whole counsel of God. Have an allegiance to Christ and His word, not your denomination or particular church. You might suffer persecution, but Christ said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do we actually believe this or do we just quote it? Do we believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God? Or is it just a cute memory verse that we have in our collection? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Is this one of the reasons why so many churches are a mess? Also, how many pastors are truly qualified? I'm not asking if they've been to seminary because that is not a qualification. I'm asking how many passed the test of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. To be a pastor, according to scripture, you must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. Being a pastor used to be a sacrifice and a position where one really needed to know God. Sadly today, mainly in the Western culture, it is a prestigious position with a great paycheck and benefits, which is why it's often viewed as a wise and profitable career choice. It's a job today, a good, respectable, good paying job. A job? Is that what a pastor should be? The church needs pastors with a burden for the body, where their preaching and shepherding will reflect that burden and that love. Sadly, the qualifications to become a pastor as seen in scripture are too often being ignored. And instead, what is sought out is one who has been to seminary and is well educated. The pattern of the world is creeping into the church. Christ said, what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. God doesn't look for the highly educated. What does Acts 4 say? Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God isn't looking for well-educated, spiritually dead men to lead his church into spiritual ruin. He's looking for godly men, with godly character, who might be educated, but that's not the principal trait a pastor should have. A pastor should be a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but instead one who will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. One who will look to shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, 
not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. A pastor should be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, one who will give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. It is a great responsibility to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And we shouldn't expect any less for a man called to be an example to the body. These qualifications are frequently completely ignored to the detriment of the church. Ephesians 4 tells us that he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is something Christ himself ordained. So in ignoring or willfully disobeying these passages, something that is so dear to Christ is being treated as a common thing that man can tamper with. Pick up your Bible, immerse yourself in its pages. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Know the word so that you will know the truth. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. For I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The church is not a haven for sin, error, or conformity to the world, nor is it a place for the world. It is where we are to grow in holiness and worship God in spirit and truth among other believers. Yet why is this often not the case? Horatius Bonner summed it up like this. I looked for the church and I found it in the world. I looked for the world and I found it in the church. This is one of the reasons that instead of changing the world, the world is changing the church. We are told do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Yet it is unbelievers that are not only being welcomed into so many churches, but so many churches are catering to them. The church is for believers. Oh, how wrong so many have got it. This is elementary stuff. If the foundation is weak, the building will come crumbling down. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. Do not be like the world, but instead be salt and light to a dying world. And not only to a dying world, but to so many churches that have so greatly fallen. Speak the truth in love. Don't have an unwavering loyalty to your church building or denomination in spite of what scripture teaches. Have that loyalty to Christ and his truth as it is laid out in his word. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let love be without hypocrisy. Christ said, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Tertullian, an early Christian writer writing around 280, wrote that non-believers would say of Christians, Look how they love one another. What a beautiful way to describe the church, but is this a way Christians would be described today? We might instead hear something like what Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So what is the cure? Do not be hearers only, but doers of the word. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Apostle Paul wrote for us to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, and to owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. As the body of Christ, we are called to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another. We need to exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are all members of the same body, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. This is how things ought to be. In Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul urges us to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. We are told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, and to put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, 
and covetousness, which is idolatry. Let us, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our great Lord and Savior who loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish.